Good morning, one and all, and welcome back to another episode of The Damage Report with me, John Iderola, broadcasting from home for reasons that don't bear going into. But I am here, and much more important than that, so too is, I believe, it's Sabrina. Sabrina, welcome back to the show. Ah, good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to have you here. In particular, uh, I mean, we're gonna talk about a lot of awesome news and always get to break down politics with you. We've got uh, Fox going woke and Donald Trump gets bad news on a number of his different uh, legal like little situations that are going on. And will Tucker Carlson run for president? All that stuff is interesting. But we do have to talk about Twitch in the aftermath. Uh, you are a Twitch streamer and has have been for a number of years. Well, uh, some Twitch streamers are getting into the AI game, I think. There might be an opening for me and you to do the same. So we're going to be talking about that in a little bit. But anyway, uh, thank you for being here. It's great to have uh, you give us some of your time. I love being here. I'm so excited. Let's go. It's great to have you here. Well, but wait, wait, wait. before we go, uh, you're it's not just you that's here. Eva is here as well. Yes. So thank you. If you're on the podcast, you can't tell that his dog Eva is visible on stream. Yeah, she's on her little perch. She Adorable. is ready to talk politics, huh? Ready to talk politics. Oh, also, by the way. So you know how like um, basically everything online is constantly taking stuff that you posted like a year or ten years ago and throwing it in your <laughs> face or whatever. That's the internet. Um, yeah, I actually I I like that. Well, I mean I don't like it when other people <laughs> do it to you, but when the <laughs> service does it, it can be fun. It'll like show you pictures or something. Facebook has a thing where it'll resurface posts that you put on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, those are all old because I haven't posted on Facebook in many years. But I got one. That let me know that my dog's adoption birthday 13 years ago was yesterday. <gasps> oh and my gosh. I had no idea what his birthday was, but Facebook, thankfully, let me know. And so my little doggy, somewhere between 13 and 14 years old, he was a rescue, but dogs are the best. All right, that's what Facebook we're going to be talking doing about. Some good. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that I is didn't a good know thing. it was the algorithm, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we do have a lot that we're gonna be talking about. And along the way, if you'd mind hitting the like button and sharing the stream, that would be great. And Sabrina and I can respond as we go. I I talk to our legal team. I am able to give Blue Apron gift cards away from home. So I will still be doing that ideally if you send a particularly good message. So get those in. But with all that said, Sabrina, you ready to talk some news? Let's do it. Okay, let's do it starting off with this. According to the Daily Signal, Fox News employees are allowed to use bathrooms that align with their gender identity inside the building rather than their biological sex. And they must be addressed by their preferred name and pronouns in the workplace. All these policies reportedly outlined in the company's employee handbook, according to the Daily Signal. The handbook promises that Fox is dedicated to expanding and strengthening reports or I'm sorry, efforts to sustain a more inclusive work environment. It also states that employees who are transitioning their gender have the right to be open about their transition and work in an environment free of harassment, discrimination, and without fear of transphobia. It doesn't even stop there. The handbook allegedly defines many LGBTQ terms like cisgender, gender fluid, and non-binary. Dear God, Fox is gone woke. Stop the presses. Particularly Fox's presses, assuming they have presses. I don't think they have presses anymore, but if they did, you should stop them because they've gone woke because Fox is complying with New York State and city law, and that's unacceptable. That's the actual takeaway, worded slightly differently from Rob Schmidt of Newsmax. He's responding to a Daily Signal article that appears to show that Fox News has taken the unprecedented and unacceptable steps of protecting its employees from harassment. No, really, that was one of the things that he cited, that they should have a workplace free from harassment, and that cannot be born. We need to be free to harass these people clean out of the news industry. But anyway, we're gonna get back to more of that. But the interesting thing, before we dive into the substance of it, is that this is Newsmax attacking Fox. And why wouldn't they? They see an opening right now with Tucker Carlson being fired. Newsmax wants to jump in that new audience. But interestingly, uh, it was pointed out by Matthew Gertz on Twitter. Uh, Newsmax has a, an expansion of their studio going on right now in New York City. So they already are there. They're expanding to this massive 24,000 square foot office space. And the thing about that is New York City, as I just said, has these uh, guidelines. That's what the law is. You do actually have to do all of what he just cited from that Daily Signal article, which means so will Newsmax actually. 
So as they're attacking Fox, they're gonna be doing the same thing. Now, none of this matters. It's it's literally the legally mandated bare minimum for how you should treat your employees, but they are just as culpable. If Fox has gone woke, the Newsmax is rushing to go woke too. We're gonna get into what was revealed, Sabrina, but what do you think about this? Are you worried about Fox going forward? Are they gonna are they gonna start supporting DSA members or what's going on over there? <laughs> As cool as it would be if um, Fox became Team DSA or you know actually went woke, um, it's not actually about them going woke. As we know, I think it's more about them not wanting to go broke. I think they've <laughs> been making a lot of expensive mistakes lately, and it's just a liability issue for them. They don't want any more. Um, they don't want any harassment cases. They don't want any more lawsuits. And this would be you know an easy way to minimize it. They're really crossing their fingers. And hoping workers there aren't actually reading their handbooks, which you know probably not. They're reading Truth Social, but yeah. um, if they're if, if Newsmax is you know constructing you know um, more office spaces, if they if they really you know have such an issue um, with people using you know the bathroom that aligns with their preferred gender, why don't they just make more single use stalls while they're doing their construction? If it's that much of an issue for them. But it's not. It really isn't. They're just, you know, projecting onto their audience what they think their audience wants to hear. But really, yeah, they're just they're dumb. <laughs> yeah, there's no there's no reasoning with them to help uh -huh. them ameliorate the situation wherein they're being attacked by these trans people. And like, let's just find a better way to defend yourself because they're not being attacked. Mm -mm. They are just going out looking for things to be offended about, looking yeah. for rights to strip away. There's no way to reassure them because they don't want to be reassured. They want to be on the offense and so offensive they shall be. Um, but yeah, you, you, you point out like totally reasonable things. I, I would also say to any conservatives, I want to reassure you that though Fox will likely comply with these laws in New York. Do we think it matters in practice? Do we think that they're going to, there's going to be a rush of trans or just generalized LGBTQ Applicants to Fox because they're going to be <laughs> like, they're still saying all the stuff they're saying. And I look again, obviously, this is this is Griff. This is Newsmax doesn't care about what's actually going on right there. They want to they want to steal the audience. This is a zero sum game. It's all about money. It's all about influence. It's not about reality. And, and I know that because like other than maybe Matt Walsh, who literally has not gone five seconds without saying the word trans for the last 36 months. Has anyone done more critical, offensive, harassing coverage of trans people in the trans community than Fox? And that has bought them nothing. Like this tiny little bureaucratic thing that has nothing to do with their absolute goblins and ghouls that they put in front of the camera. That is enough to totally ruin their, their cred that they've built up by attacking the trans community. It's almost sad, but why don't we jump into it was actually found. The Daily Signal's big expose on Fox going woke is written by Mary Margaret Olihan. So she found that under the category of their regulations at Fox titled gender transition, they promise that the company is dedicated to expanding and strengthening efforts to sustain a more inclusive work environment. The handbook also allows employees to use the bathrooms which reflect their gender identity and outlines a dress code and use of pronouns that are inclusive of gender identity preferences. All very reasonable things, all like things that you'd be giving to your employees at Fox News that would then allow those employees to help you work to in the country. Like they're they're not going to be changing Fox from within. They'd be assisting in the mission, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just criticize them either. Now the boycotts are being called for. So Matt Walsh tweeted a lot of stuff and nobody got time for all of it. But in part, he says Fox needs to get the full Bud Light treatment. They are actively working to suppress conservative voices while promoting leftism, leftism in its most radical form. Enough is enough. Now, look, I'm going to assume that he doesn't mean like generalized leftism, tons of leftism. I think maybe he just means specifically it's like they're letting them use the bathroom to use pronouns. And I would challenge him is that really leftism in its most radical form? Is that really leftism at all? Does that have anything to do with leftism? What does that have to do with politics? This is a this is a personal thing. This is a gender identity thing. This is a cultural thing. This isn't about redistribution of wealth. 
This isn't about tax codes. What are you talking about? That it's. I know that you want to tie it to the left because you think it's harder to attack the left on its actual policies because you know that even your viewers really like a lot of that stuff. So instead, you create this boogeyman of a fake version of the trans community that doesn't actually exist doing things that they don't actually do. And then you attack that, you gradually get people to hate it and fear it. And then you tie that to the left. It's an end round because you're unable to actually fight against leftist policies. Um, but what does, it, what does it have to do at the end of the day with it? And also, Fox needs to get the full Bud Light treatment. You just mean it needs to get boycotted. Just say that it needs to be, be boycotted. That's what you're doing to Bud Light. You want to do it to this. I was like, I, during a production meeting, I was saying, Sabrina, um, this is kind of like what happens with things like uh, Coke. How you know, in a lot of parts of the country, they just call all soda Coke. Because I guess having a brand makes it more exciting or something. It's just a boycott, buddy. You could just say that. But Sabrina, what do you think? Should Fox be worried about this becoming a big issue, hurting their viewership even more? Um, no, I don't think it's gonna be a huge, huge issue at all. But I just, in, in regards to Matt Walsh, I really do want him to expand on what exactly is Bud Light treatment. Like you said, it's boycotting, but also, dare I say, it's canceling? Is he trying yep. to cancel Bud Light? Matt Walsh and hypocrites like him are so against cancel culture, which in my opinion doesn't really exist anyway. But this this isn't new. Like conservatives have always been trying to tear down and just absolutely crush anything that doesn't align with like their own personal values. So it's just it's very very funny to me that he won't call it boycotting, he won't call it uh, canceling. He has to call it the Bud Light treatment because that'll yeah. resonate with with his audience. But um, I don't think Fox has too much to to worry about in regards to their handbook. It's objectively a really good thing. I'm really glad that you point that out because it's funny how a lot of the times um, the right will purposefully take terms that mean something mm -hmm. and then they just drain it of all of its meaning. So <laughs> fake news meant something, they just started calling all news fake news and now fake news doesn't mean anything anymore. It's one of the ways that they win is by by stripping language of its meaning, its significance. Um, generally, that's us having to then change our language because they've ruined it. They've like poisoned the well. Here, they have to run from their own language because they've created these constructs that they know they're playing into, so now they need to avoid actually um, uh, using the term. And it's great too that it's not like Fox needs to get the Bud Light treatment, needs to get canceled, as you pointed out, because I don't know, Sean Hannity did something in his personal life that was bad. This is explicitly canceling them for political correctness. <laughs> like, this is like they're trying to do what is politically like. Required, and when I say political correctness here, I mean legally correct. And he's saying, I don't like your political statement. It was not from my perspective politically correct, and thus I have a big issue with you. It is, you could not come up with something that is more emblematic of exactly what they say the left does that they shouldn't do. It is the exact same thing because those those attacks, the cancel culture, the political, it's never meant anything. It was never an actual standard that was meant to apply to everyone. It was a convenient way to attack the left, generalized left, including Democrats, and that's it. But anyway, this is also personal, by the way. It like for the same reason that Newsmax is trying to take Fox's audience. Now Matt Walsh is really mad because Big Daddy Tucker Carlson isn't there anymore to put him on air. Tucker Carlson would put Matt Walsh on the show every week. I don't know, every month. I don't watch it, but I don't know. But he was on there often in any event. And that was valuable. That would be a way to expand his reach, get more people to go watch him. That's what he wants because this is about money. This isn't about the actual policy. And so all of them are just eating each other because they just desperately want more pointless money that they'll never be able to spend. And so he'd been bringing them on. God knows now what's gonna happen. Although Matt Walsh appears to think there was no chance of him being brought back on because he's definitely burning the bridge now. And so he's gonna be fine. He's gonna be paid by millionaires and billionaires for the rest of his life. But um, one of the avenues for more money might have been cut off, Sabrina. Boo hoo, poor Matt Walsh. I am so sorry for him. <laughs> you sound it, <laughs> you sound it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's not the only issue. While Fox is being attacked for supposedly going woke because they're complying with New York law and things like access to bathrooms and things like that. They're also being attacked for their 
commentary thus far on the Republican primary. Donald Trump bleated uh, attacking Laura Ingram that uh, she just did a hit piece on me. There go her ratings, showing suppose which indicate that Ron DeSanctimonious may do better against Biden than I would. When actually polls show that I do much better against Biden than Rob. He already called him Ron in that paragraph and now he's back to Rob. The poll you're looking at now, which has me doing far better against Crooked Joe was just put out by Fox. I am sure unhappily, I'm also leading to Sanctus by over 40 minutes in primary voting. Okay, so he's saying that you can't trust the polls that she's showing. It's not convincing or whatever. Why don't we show what she actually said? And decide. So with the Sanders about to enter the race, and Trump's still, of course, the front runner by quite a bit, who's going to be stronger against presumptively Biden in the battleground states? Donald Trump and almost almost all the polls that we've seen that have been done so far, granted it's early, is behind Joe Biden. Now, Joe Biden's running pretty badly against generic Republicans, maybe against a Tim Scott or against a Ron DeSantis type figure, but he's consistently beating Donald Trump. All right, let's look at the polls, DeSantis head to head uh, against Biden. Now, this is Georgia. This is Georgia, and this is a good sign for general Republicans to look at, because like you said, Georgia was a state that was just lost. Georgia's got some Democratic senators now. To see Republicans this far out leading, except for Joe, except for Donald Trump, leading Joe Biden shows a lot of the weaknesses that he's got. Trump and Trump is extremely well defined, so we're seeing him behind, but we're seeing folks like maybe Ron DeSantis actually beating Joe Biden in all these different states. And what we've seen really from everything has shown, all the numbers we've seen have shown, is that in 2016, Donald Trump probably hit the ceiling is going to get. Okay, so Trump is mad, understandably, not just because of one poll, it's the fact that they chose to do the segment. She brought on a guest to come and say that he had hit his ceiling seven years ago, that not only is he doing bad against Biden, but Ron DeSantis might be beating him. Like This is all unacceptable from Trump's point of view. But I would point out before we discuss Sabrina that while obviously this segment was designed to attack Trump, it also represents in a much quieter way them still being really nice to him. Because the point of this segment is for you to take away, you know what, it might be risky to have him run in 2024. But there's much more compelling evidence than they're willing to present. They could simply say he lost in 2020. That's very strong evidence that he would have a hard time beating Biden because he didn't beat Biden the last time. Now, Lori Aram can't just come out and say that because she knows that that's crossing a line with the audience. That's challenging the dogma of the big lie. But she could say that instead, and she's choosing not to. What do you think? No, I absolutely agree with you. She's trying very hard not to um, alienate the audience, even though we've you know learned behind closed doors she's not the biggest fan of um, Trump. But I, I'm more concerned with um, just how well Ron DeSantis is in these polls. Um, I mean, reading Donald Trump's uh, post on Truth Social, it does feel like I'm reading a bad Yelp review. But I think in that there's still a, a fear of how viable Ron DeSantis actually is, considering like the the regressive changes that he's enacting in Florida, like on trans issues, on abortion issues, on issues of, of regarding undocumented people. Like, yes, Trump is going to complain. I don't think um, there's going to be much to worry about there. I'm I'm much more worried about Ron. Yeah, I don't know. Look, I, I would say in general. Like there, there are polls that show all of these. There are polls showing mm-hmm. Trump beating Biden. There's polls showing Biden beating Trump. And like, there's the national polls and there's the the state level polls. Like, there's a lot of that stuff. And we are many, many months out from the election. Um, so I, I find it interesting. I'll find it more interesting the closer we get to the election. But any one of them can can pick these polls out and show what they want. You know, like in one particular like snapshot. But the thing that I think makes Trump feel so sensitive in this area is he knows knows that this is not a new thing. Like he knows multiple election cycles, what effect he's had not only on his own election, but on other people's elections. It obviously burns him up that he's such a drag on the party and that he definitely does have a ceiling. I don't know if he reached it in 2016 or in 2020, but that's why I think he's so sensitive about this and he's lashing out at it. It's because he sees it as a potential argument, not necessarily even for Ron DeSantis, but for Someone else, I don't think it's a Tim Scott, I don't know, Glenn Youngkin or something. But I think that that will be one of the things if they go with a different candidate, which I doubt they will, that I think will be most persuasive to them. Any final thoughts? 
No, no, that was about it. Yeah, even the polls that they were referencing were different. Like one of them was regarding Georgia, the one that Laura Ingram showed. And then the one that he put in his truth social post was the Rust Belt states. Um, so yeah, he's just yeah. choosing whatever poll makes him look better. And that's what they do. Yeah, that's what they do. Okay, but we're gonna take our first break. When we come back though, we got some important news, including other things that might affect Donald Trump's perception amongst the voters, legal developments after this. Okay, everybody, lots more news to get to. If you're just joining us right now, please hit the like button so that people know we're live. We're about to jump into news. I just wanted to read one comment from Poodle Hat Dragon it says, Sabrina, next time in the ring, can you take on Marge Green? Use brass knuckles if you need to. <laughs> no, no brass knuckles. Um, do you think you will be boxing again? Uh, so after I did Creator Clash last month in April, um, as soon as I got back home, I felt a Creator Crash where I just I missed <laughs> boxing. So I started doing boxing classes um, nearby so I can stay warm. So if, nice. if okay, so if you're still miss- training. Yo, oh, yeah. So if Marjorie Taylor oh, Green wants to hop in the ring, uh, I mean, I don't want to platform her, but I'll. I'll I'll go in a ring with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how she do. Like I know that she does she does CrossFit and she seems <laughs> to take it very seriously. <laughs> She'd yeah. probably do okay. I don't know if she's done any like combat stuff, but you, you know who um, else loves CrossFit? Physical therapists. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're saying. I thought that was a joke <laughs> about her. The rumors of her, I see what you're saying there. (laughs) Well, anyway, everyone, if you're out there doing CrossFit, uh, take it easy on yourself. Um, You know, be be safe, be safe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, with that said, why don't we jump into the news? We've been waiting to hear updates on the classified document scandal, and we've got one. And this is a really interesting update because I really see it as occupying two spaces simultaneously. There is the space it occupies in terms of how the media is talking about it and how the investigators of the classified document scandal see it. And then how I see it as a person who's just been following this story. Let me give you the details and we'll see which side you end up on and I'll describe them. So basically, federal prosecutors apparently have evidence that Donald Trump was put on notice that he could not in fact retain any classified documents after he was subpoenaed for the return last year. So. There's multiple points where you could know that you're not supposed to be taking these documents. Uh, Ideally uh, ever, you could know that to begin with, you don't steal documents. But then once you've stolen them, you've brought them back to Mar-a-Lago. When you are subpoenaed to return them, you now know officially that you're not supposed to have them. And this is an update for reasons that are not entirely clear to me because he was subpoenaed. That is a very strong signal that you can't have them. I don't necessarily understand why this is legally distinct, but I am being told by very serious people who went to great law schools that it is. So I'm gonna give you the details to flesh it out a little bit. Last June, Evan Corcoran, who's a Trump lawyer, at least for now, we'll see in a week or so, apparently found roughly 40 classified documents in the storage room at Mar-a-Lago and told the DOJ that no further materials remained at the property. Now, importantly, that turned out not to be true. Uh, They eventually served the warrant, came and got 101 additional classified documents. Uh, The warning was one of several key moments that Corcoran preserved in roughly 50 pages of dictated notes described to the Guardian over several weeks by three people. And that is really interesting. So we had heard that there was some documentation, contemporaneous documentation about the timeline, but 50 pages of notes taken all along the way by a lawyer That is more in depth than we had known. We also know that there's some overlap between Corcoran and Walt Nauda, the valet for Trump who's popped up occasionally during this story. He told the DOJ that Trump told him to move boxes out of the storage room before and after the subpoena. That activity was captured on surveillance footage. And the notes of Corcoran described how Nauda told, how Corcoran told Nauda about the subpoena before he started looking for the classified documents because he needed Corcoran, to, um, they needed Nauda to unlock the storage room door for him. Nauda apparently offered to help him go through the boxes, which he declined, but going through 60 boxes of documents took longer than expected. And so they also say that because it took so long, there was extended periods where no one was actually watching the documents, or at least no one who is supposed to be watching the documents was watching them. And so that theoretically opens up even more of an opportunity for some boxes to be taken away. 
Of course, they left hundred uh, over a hundred documents even after that. But the allegation is that Trump knew that he wasn't supposed to have the documents right now, and at that point dispatched one of his foot soldiers to go and move them away, or at least that's what's being alleged at this point. I'm just gonna add one more detail to this. Apparently in Corcoran's notes, he describes how Trump reacted to some of this news, including his facial expressions. He says that Trump appeared to be irritated, not only by the process, but by the notes that Corcoran was taken. And so here's here's my little thing. So there's the way the media is talking about this, and there's the way I think it. The media is saying, "Oh damn, we got him. He knew he wasn't supposed to have this thing. And to their credit, or I guess in their defense, uh, the state of mind of Trump seems to be the only thing that matters in all this. Whether he actually committed the crime, which he did, seems utterly irrelevant. Nobody cares that he committed the crime. They're all focused on, but how much did he know that he was committing the crime? And so they say, this is an important piece in proving that. To me, we know that he had been subpoenaed. We know that they had been contacted by the National Archives. I don't understand how many more times he needs to have been told that he can't have the documents before he has to turn them over. But anyway, they say it's important. Sabrina, what do you think? I don't think there's a number on like how many times he needs to be told because he, not, there's no consequences. He keeps getting away with this. Like, cool, they're building this obstruction case against him. Great, but then what? He's, I, I'm doubtful he's ever gonna face any real consequences. He's clearly never gonna see like the inside of a prison cell anyway. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not hopeful. That is definitely excited. the fear, um, <laughs> but they're confident. They're confident. Again? And get, I love that it's that that that's the point that's supposed to give us hope. Not that he definitely did it. So weird that you're allowed to get away with when you're wealthy, when you're powerful. It's like they let you do it. But anyway, um, let's see. Okay, we're gonna set aside that legal update. We'll see if this one is a little bit spicier for you. We had predicted in the wake of the E. Jean Carroll verdict against Donald Trump, where he has to pay $5 million, that were he to reassert the same claims about E. Jean Carroll, about the details of the alleged sexual assault that happened, that that would be dangerous for him. Because now there's a precedent that that sort of speech is monetarily damaging to him. Well, it didn't take long for him to test that theory. We know that he immediately went on CNN's town hall to mock and insult her. So that was gonna be a huge test of this. In case you didn't see that, and you probably shouldn't have, here's a little bit of what we're gonna be talking about. This woman, I don't know her, I never met her. I have no idea who she is. I had a picture taken years ago with her and her husband, nice guy, John Johnson. He was a newscaster, very nice man. She called him an ape, happens to be African American, called him an ape. The judge wouldn't allow us to put that in, her dog, or her cat was named Vagina. The judge wasn't allowed to put that in. All of these things, he would, but with her, they could put in anything. Access this Hollywood. This is a jury of nine people who found right. you liable of sexual abuse. Do you think that, that that will deter women from voting for you? No, I don't think so, because I think the whole thing, just so you understand, ready? I never met this woman, I never saw this woman. This woman said, I met her at the front door of Bergdorf Goodman, which I rarely go into other than for a couple of charities. I met her in the front door. She was about 60 years old, and this is like 22, 23 years ago. I met her in the front door of Bergdorf Goodman. I was immediately attracted to her, and she was immediately attracted to me. And we had this great chemistry. We're walking into a crowded department, so, we had this great chemistry, and a few minutes later, we end up in a, a room, a dressing room of Bergdorf Goodman, <laughs> right near the cash register. And then she found out there were locks on the door. So she said, I found one that was open. She found one. She learned this at trial. She found one that was open. What kind of a woman meets somebody and brings them up, and within minutes, you're playing hanky-panky in a dressing room, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you, she was married then or not. John Johnson, I feel sorry for you, John Mr. Johnson. Mr. President. Okay, so that's a major test of the theory that we laid out because that was absolutely viciously attacking and defaming her. In the, I was, I was gonna say exact same way as the, the stuff that got him fined $5 million, but he added new ones. The thing about the cat, 
I mean, I can only imagine if the jurors had known that the cat was named Vagina, then that would have changed everything in a way that he's never defined and never will. Uh, viciously attacking her, saying what kind of a woman would do this, absolutely disgusting stuff. And we're gonna see if it costs him because E. Jean Carroll is now amending the first of her two defamation lawsuits. She is demanding an additional $10 million, citing the comments that he made on CNN. Uh, they say um, that uh, Trump's defamatory statements post verdict show the depth of his malice towards Carroll. Since it's hard to imagine defamatory conduct that could possibly be more motivated by hatred, ill will or spite. This conduct supports a very substantial punitive damages award. And um, I, I hope that they are awake and caffeinated because they're gonna have to amend it again. Because as of this morning, he's back to attack here on Truth Social. His Truth Social posts were involved in his first in the first uh, decision. Well, now he's got this. I don't know E. Jean Carroll, I never met or touched her. He does the thing about her husband, he does the thing about the book. It's a scam, it's unfair, it never happened. This is the exact sort of defamation that got him fined the $5 million. So that again does not mean that in America, which is a failed state, that he will again be found guilty or at least liable, I should say, for the money. But he is certainly testing that, Sabrina, and the lawyers are. They've already pounced. What do you think? I'm very confused because he keeps saying that he doesn't know her, he never met her. And yet, in that video that you just played, he just went and described it in detail, saying there was immediate chemistry and he was recounting it as if it was from his memory. I don't understand why he would go back and forth on that anyway. It just shows how not credible he is. Um, Good for uh, E. Jean Carroll for um, amending it to get an extra 10 million as she should. Um, it's the least she can get because um, also it's not even just a matter of um, whether she's gonna win this or not. Um, I mean, she's I know she's kind of like happier right now um, because it is going well for her, but it's not real justice. It still happened and because Trump does still have a lot of online influence, I'm sure that she and like her family members and supporters um, are getting like harassed online as a result. Definitely. So it's not like a real form of justice, but it's it's something. Um, so I look forward uh, to her amendment. Good for her, get your money. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, it's designed to, I mean, we, the way that these sorts of decisions are used in the modern era is like, it's an approximation for justice when we can't get justice, but it's designed to change the behavior going forward. The idea is supposed to be that he'll stop doing it. That was an interesting theory, it didn't work. The $5 million is not enough to change his behavior. And so it only makes sense if the idea is to change his behavior, that obviously you gotta jack up the amount of money. I would say doubling it doesn't seem like enough. I don't see why that would change his behavior. I would say it should be multiplied by at least a factor of 10. And if that doesn't work, then do it again. Like he is repeatedly doing the exact same thing. He is not only spitting in the face of E. Jean Carroll, he's spitting in the face of the judicial system, of that judge, of that court, of that jury, every time, repeatedly, day after day. So the question is gonna be on the judge, on them, like what are they gonna do about it? As of right now, Trump has not responded to requests for comment on this. Um, so finally, I guess he's had enough to say about this for a little bit. Um, oh. Final point goes to you. Yes, can I just say, um, cuz I, I watched um, other uh, men go on like conservative shows um, after this was announced to see to see like their reactions. And a lot of men were just so happy. They called it a win for Donald Trump because it was only labeled sexual abuse and they didn't call him a rapist necessarily. Like a lot of men walked away from that just absolutely delusional saying, yeah, that's a win. What is that teaching men? That's teaching men that, hey, he got away with it. I can get away with it too. I won't be called a rapist. So just more negative influence is coming from this. It's yeah, yeah it, it's only so much justice. Yeah, 100%. I, I saw that response as well and it's disgusting. Okay, that said, um, why don't we mix things up and jump to a very different topic uh, mm -hmm. whenever we're ready. Eight additional plaintiffs have now joined on to the challenge of Texas's abortion, uh, new abortion restrictions. Uh, they're joining the seven that launched the case back a couple of months ago. 15 plaintiffs now telling their stories about how these new anti-abortion laws 
have uh, contributed to a massive amount of suffering in their lives. And uh, we're gonna share some of the details that these people um, have talked about their experiences. Uh, because I can't think of a better way to get people to understand the actual cost, the toll to these sorts of policies. So this is gonna be difficult. Um, these experiences are very rough and uh, buckle up. Uh, Jessica Bernardo, Kirsten Hogan, Elizabeth Weller shared harrowing stories of fetal anomalies, medical gaslighting, and in Hogan's case, being detained at a religious hospital against her will and being forced to give birth to a stillbirth son. Let's jump into some of these examples. Uh, Weller was hospitalized after her water broke at 19 weeks. She was given antibiotics and according to the suit, instructed to pray. Her OBGYN concluded that without an abortion, she risked an infection and could lose her uterus or even her life. But the hospital, again, a religious hospital, refused to clear the procedure because the antibiotics made such an infection less likely. Okay? There was no talk of an abortion, no talk of emergency procedures. They said they would wait, monitor the situation and hope that her prayer, I guess, was answered. Two of the women in the original suit, Lauren Miller, Ashley Brandt, had been pregnant with twins. Each discovered that one of her twins had severe abnormalities and wouldn't survive. In both cases, only by aborting the doomed twin could they protect the life of the viable one, as well as their own health. And of course, that is deemed unacceptable in this case. No, you have to continue the pregnancy, even if it results in the loss of the second fetus or the loss of the mother. That's the actual policy, in fact. We have Kylie Beaton, again, severe like developmental issues during the pregnancy. In this particular case, the head normal rate faster than the rest of the body of the fetus. By the time she received the diagnosis at 20 weeks, her baby's head was the size of a 24 week old. That only increased. She was already, by the way, past the cutoff point for an abortion in neighboring New York at that point, or New Mexico at that point. By the time she was 28 weeks pregnant, her baby's head was the size of a 39 week old fetus. She asked to be induced, but providers refused, citing the state's abortion ban. At 35 weeks, she was finally granted a cesarean section. Her son survived for four days. And we have one more I want to talk about. And again, severe developmental issues. Fetus develops missing pieces of brain and skull. It's a fatal diagnosis. Again, that seems definitive in this sort of case, but Texas is not a reasonable place. It simply isn't. Samantha Cassiano says that she was told she would have to go through with the pregnancy, prescribed an antidepressant, and sent home. She spent the remainder of her pregnancy accepting well wishes from strangers while planning a funeral for her daughter. Her daughter lived for four hours after birth, but she was forced to still continue the pregnancy for months and months and months, knowing that it is was not going to survive. These are unacceptably heart-wrenching, horrific stories. And this is just the 15 people that have come forward so far. Every day it is possible that people in Texas are experiencing the exact same thing. And so I am very hopeful about this challenge. We'll see. Sabrina, what do you think? That's scary. That's so scary. Um, Because also Texas is a really, really, really big state. So even if somebody wanted to try to travel outside of a state to take off work, to travel that distance, to recover, like it's, it's so much harder than it would seem. So it's very scary. A lot of women are dying and are going to die as a result of this. So I'm also very hopeful for this lawsuit because this absolutely needs to be overturned. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know if there are doctors um, who are still doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, hopefully they are, but this is this is scary and just wrong and evil. Yeah, I mean, look, the issue is that there's obviously there are some doctors who wanted legal cover to never have to do mm-hmm. a procedure like this. Again, not because of their medical expertise, but because of their predisposition politically or religiously. And then there's a lot more that probably would be perfectly happy to do these sorts of procedures, but are terrified. The reason they're terrified is we talk about the state by state bans and we'll be like, this one has no exceptions. This one has an exception for incest. This one has an exception for the health of the mother. As if those terms mean a specific thing, they don't. They're just the beginnings of a legal process. You would say we're doing this for X reason, But who gets to decide if it fits? Well, Officials in that state get to get to decide. Judges appointed by red state governors get to decide. And when the penalties are as bad as they are for the doctors. So for instance, 
In Texas, doctors who were found guilty of providing an abortion in violation of the bans face up to 99 years in prison and a minimum of $100,000 in fines, which might be hard to pay off when you're spending the next century in jail. Um, are you going to be willing to go through this process for each individual case? We have to go before a judge and you have to prove all this stuff. And they're challenging the science, even though they don't know what it is. They're terrified, and so they don't want to lose their license. They don't want to be fined. They certainly don't want to be locked up. And so even in cases where the exception exists, it doesn't exist in practice. And that's how this is designed. Those exceptions are not put in place because they've looked at, man, there are a lot of people getting pregnant, having these horrible experiences, so let's protect them. They do it to sell the policy because they know how radical these policies are. They're trying to avoid the electoral backlash. But the backlash exists, it just exists in terms of human suffering for the people that have to live under this regressive political regime. Anyway, also, final point goes to you. Yeah, can I ask like how are laws like these even enforceable when when HIPAA laws exist? Like how, like this is people's private medical information. Um, I, I don't even know what that process is like. Like have they been successful at all in charging any people for getting abortions in Texas? Like would you happen to know that? I, I haven't seen any like successful uh, prosecutions, mm -hmm. but um, I, we will definitely look into it. Anyway, it's definitely the idea. Um, a hearing the case hasn't been set yet, so we have no idea at this point what the actual timeline will be. But I think a lot of people in Texas and in other states are really curious to see how this goes. Okay, with that said, we do have to take a break. We'll be back in just a few. Sorry, the social break got the better of me there. But what I am curious about is uh, back in the 90s, it was called political correctness. It's now cancel culture. What will it be called in 10 years? They'll have some new, I guess wokeness is what they call it now. In 10 years, they will have some new term that just means how dare you be bothered in any way by my racist, misogynistic, transphobic comments. That's all that it means. They need some sort of rhetorical cover and they will find it. Okay, um, I'm going to call an all. Oh, ah. Have much time. Let's just jump immediately into the Steve Lock. This video posted overnight showing a U Haul truck slamming into barriers at Lafayette Square, a block away from the White House. Investigators removing a flag with a swastika from the scene. Yes, it looks like we had an attempted, if not likely to succeed, attack on the White House, or at least that's how it's being presented. A 19 year old Missouri man, the truck that you saw in that video was driven into the barriers near the White House. He apparently was heard making incriminating statements that have led investigators to believe that he was seeking to harm the president. You can see a photo of the 19 year old here, Sai Varshith Kandula of Chesterfield. Um, he was obviously stopped. The White House has always had security, including against attempts to drive trucks through the gates. Those have been made even stronger in the last few years. So. It wasn't likely to work, but it is still concerning. And here are more of the details. Driver was taken into custody. Um, there was apparently uh, now charges threatened to kill, kidnap, or inflict harm on the president, the VP, or a family member of them. Also facing charges of assault with a dangerous weapon, reckless operation of a motor vehicle, destruction of federal property, and trespassing. Um, it is believed that the truck is the only weapon that's been identified so far. There were no weapons, there were no explosives. However, in the back of the truck, there was apparently this Nazi flag that people walking by were able to take snapshots of. Nobody was hurt or anything like that. We don't know exactly what was going on in the White House. We believe that President Biden was meeting with Kevin McCarthy at that point. But Sabrina, what do you think? Wait, wait, so let me get this straight. We have no problem with civil war reenactments, but somebody tries to reenact January 6th and everybody just goes bananas. Like, come on, it's it's not about white supremacy. It's about individual rights, okay? <laughs> That's what this is about. So making their voice heard on the big lie and the 2000 mules and the ballot harvesting. Look, we, we have no idea uh, anything of this person's politics, mm -hmm. we don't know. We know that they say that incriminating statements were made. We notably do not have those statements, so we don't know exactly what claims were made. We don't know if this person wanted to hurt Biden because they're a right winger, because they're a left winger, doesn't like his politics. The Nazi flag in the back implies that they could be a right winger, mm -hmm. but it's not proof. Maybe they were planning to post it saying that Biden is a Nazi, I don't know, I don't like it. 
Um, but I do know that if you are feeling defensive about this, uh, there is a defense against that defensiveness. Uh, just claim that it's a false flag and the right <laughs> is already doing it. Because you see, he had a Nazi flag and that proves that this is made up. This was just the CIA or something. They planted a flag there. Even they find the flag to not be that impressive, but that itself is proof that they it definitely was the C. I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is that there is political violence. There's a lot of crazy people out there, but you don't ever have to worry about those people agreeing with you politically because that, by definition, makes it a false flag. Anyway, we'll give you more details as they come. If they ever come, there's no guarantee they will. But with that, why don't we jump? into this next story. Republicans need a new leader and Tucker Carlson is ready to lead. No one in America is more articulate and pins down leftists in both parties better than Tucker. Tucker always fought for us like Rush Limbaugh did. Tucker Carlson is witty, sharp and mocks woke nonsense. Tucker will whip Biden in a debate. Sign the petition, draft Tucker Carlson for president. Oh, geez, this is a big new tuckerpack.com. They're going to bring in Tucker Carlson. I mean, this has sort of been one of our fears. Like, that would really shake things up, it would dramatically change the presidential primary. Um, I don't know when we'll know, you know, if this is going to happen. Obviously, Tucker's got his new show that he's like lining up. He's obviously very busy, but you have to weigh this uh, seriously and consider the, oh, no, they've already said they're not going to do it. Uh, they've sent a cease and desist, Tucker Carlson's lawyers have. Uh, telling this draft Tucker thing that no, you can't, you can't do this. You especially can't raise money off of Tucker Carlson's name and face. Here's a little bit of the statements from Harmeet Dillon, a lawyer for Tucker Carlson, saying, "Mr. Carlson will not run for president in 2024 under any circumstances, and therefore your misrepresentations are damaging to Mr. Carlson and defrauding his supporters. And how dare you defraud his supporters? That's his job, Mister." Anyway. If you do not immediately cease and desist your efforts to solicit money to draft Mr. Carlson, we will use every legal means at our disposal to vindicate his rights and protect his supporters from these misrepresentations. And they go on to point out that using his name and face to personally and financially benefit themselves, including paying the leader of this thing, is unacceptable. Again, the, the exploitation is supposed to flow in only one direction, from the supporters to Tucker Carlson, who would very much like to have an eighth mansion with a TV studio in it. How dare you get in on the grift? Sabrina, what do you think? I love how this video looks like a spoof ad. Like, is it this does, what political ads look like now with the rock guitar in the background? And it just, it just looked fake. But I also saw that um, the, the people who put this ad together, the pack, that they did reach out to Tucker Carlson and be like, hey, you wanna run for president? And, and he didn't seem to express very strong interest. And they went ahead and they released this ad anyway. Um, so you know, good on his team for uh, sending a cease and desist um, before they made some real money. Because I think I read that that ad only pulled in a whopping $212. So I guess that's not enough to um, keep yeah. their website up considering it's gone now. <laughs> yeah, it's got well, that now I guess might be for legal reasons that they've <laughs> taken it down because they're very worried about being sued into the ground. But um, yeah, it is interesting to speculate. By the way, him, them attacking this does not mean that they will never, that he would never run for president. I mean, it's evidence that he wouldn't, but if he was going to, he certainly wouldn't want this group raising a bunch of money that he would prefer oh, yeah. to take for himself. Um, so that said, this is probably the last we'll hear of these people. Um, but I do want to just focus on one thing because this is them trying to appeal to Tucker Carlson supporters. And look at the way that they did that. Here is a screenshot from nine seconds into the video. They just basically took a bunch of people of color, generally women of color, and they're like, oh, look at these scary people. I don't even know who some of those people are. They're not like the most powerful people in American politics. But these the, the people behind the draft Tucker know who his supporters want to see him attack. And they love him attacking women of color. And so they just flooded the screen with them, um, even though it has nothing to do with the presidential race. So uh, they're definitely revealing something about themselves and the base in that. Anyway, that is unfortunately all the time we have for the first hour of the show, but more to come in the aftermath, everybody. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.